Hello and welcome to the Strange Tales podcast presented by me your host Winston R. Douglas. We are a weekly podcast that looks at weird and wonderful tales from history, true crime, conspiracies and much more. I will try to cover various topics from different eras hopefully we can take a journey through history together. If you are a first time listener please look back on our previous episodes, if you are a returning listener thank you for your continual support. If you enjoy the podcast please smash that gorgeous like button, and subscribe so that you will be notified to future shows. Also if you could write a 5 star review that would really help us get the word out, so other people can enjoy the podcast as well. You can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube at Strange Tales Pod. Or you can message me at strangetalespod at gmail.com, with feedback or ideas on future shows. If you would like to support the podcast you can do so through Patreon, go to patreon.com forward slash strange tales pod. Where we have plans from as little as 3 US dollars a month and you can opt out any time. Any help is much appreciated. This week we look into Kim Philby who was a British intelligence officer and a double agent for the Soviet Union. In 1963 he was revealed to be a member of the Cambridge Five, aspiring which passed information to the Soviet Union during World War II and in the early stages of the Cold War. Of the five, Philby is believed to have been most successful in providing secret information to the Soviets. OK let's get into today's strange tale. Born in Ambala, Punjab, British India, Philby was the son of Dora Johnston and St. John Philby, an author, Arabist and explorer. St. John was a member of the Indian Civil Service, ICS, and later a civil servant in Mesopotamia, and advisor to King Ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia. Nicknamed Kim after the boy spy in Rudyard Kipling's novel Kim, Philby attended Aldro Preparatory School, an all-boys school located in Shackleford near Godalming in Surrey. United Kingdom. In his early teens, he spent some time with the Bedouin in the desert of Saudi Arabia. Following in the footsteps of his father, Philby continued to Westminster School, which he left in 1928 at the age of 16. He won a scholarship to Trinity College, Cambridge, where he studied history and economics. He graduated in 1933 with a two-to-one degree in economics. At Cambridge, Philby showed his leaning towards communism, in the words of his father. Jack Philby went on to write, The only serious question is whether Kim definitely intended to be disloyal to the government while in its service. Upon Philby's graduation, Morris Dobb, a fellow of King's College, Cambridge and tutor in economics, introduced him to the World Federation for the Relief of the Victims of German Fascism in Paris. The World Federation for the Relief of the Victims of German Fascism, was an organization that attempted to aid the people victimized by fascism in Germany and provide education on oppositions to fascism. The organization was one of several fronts operated by German communist Willy Munzenberg, a member of the Reichstag who had fled to France in 1933. In Vienna, working to aid refugees from Nazi Germany, Philby met and fell in love with Litzi Friedman, a young Austrian communist of Hungarian Jewish origins. Philby admired the strength of her political convictions and later recalled that at their first meeting. A frank and direct person, Litzi came out and asked me how much money I had. I replied £100, which I hoped would last me about a year in Vienna. She made some calculations and announced, that will leave you in excess of £25 you can give that to the International Organization for Aid for Revolutionaries. We need it desperately. I liked her determination. Philby acted as a courier between Vienna and Prague, paying for the train tickets out of his remaining £75 and using his British passport to evade suspicion. He also delivered clothes and money to refugees from the Nazis. Following the Austro-Fascist victory in the Austrian Civil War, Friedman and Philby married in February 1934, enabling her to escape to the United Kingdom with him two months later. 
it is possible that it was a Viennese-born friend of Friedman's in London, Edith Tudor Hart, herself, at this time, a Soviet agent, who first approached Philby about the possibility of working for Soviet intelligence. In early 1934, Arnold, Deutsch, a Soviet agent, was sent to University College London under the cover of a research appointment. His intention was to recruit the brightest students from Britain's top universities. Philby had come to the Soviets' notice earlier that year in Vienna, where he had been involved in demonstrations against the government of Engelbert Dorfus. In June 1934, Deutsch recruited him to the Soviet intelligence services. Philby later recalled. Lizzie came home one evening and told me that she had arranged for me to meet a man of decisive importance. I questioned her about it but she would give me no details. The rendezvous took place in Regent's Park. The man described himself as Otto. I discovered much later from a photograph in MI5 files that the name he went by was Arnold Deutsch. I think that he was of Czech origin, about 5 feet 7 inches, stout, with blue eyes and light curly hair. Though a convinced communist, he had a strong humanistic streak. He hated London, adored Paris, and spoke of it with deeply loving affection. He was a man of considerable cultural background. Philby recommended to Deutsch several of his Cambridge contemporaries including Donald MacLean, who at the time was working in the Foreign Office, as well as Guy Burgess, despite his personal reservations about Burgess's erratic personality. In London, Philby began a career as a journalist. He took a job at a monthly magazine, the World Review of Reviews, for which he wrote a large number of articles and letters, sometimes under a variety of pseudonyms, and occasionally served as acting editor. Philby continued to live in the United Kingdom with his wife for several years. At this point, however, Philby and Litsy separated. They remained friends for many years following their separation and divorced only in 1946, just following the end of World War II. When the Germans threatened to overrun Paris in 1940, where she was then living at this time, he arranged for her escape to Britain. In 1936 he began working at a trade magazine, the Anglo-Russian Trade Gazette, as editor. The paper was failing and its owner changed the paper's role to covering Anglo-German trade. Philby engaged in a concerted effort to make contact with Germans such as Joachim von Ribbentrop, at that time the German ambassador in London. He became a member of the Anglo-German Fellowship, an organization aiming at rebuilding and supporting a friendly relationship between Germany and the United Kingdom. The Anglo-German Fellowship, at this time, was supported both by the British and German governments, and Philby made many trips to Berlin. In February 1937, Philby travelled to Seville, Spain, then embroiled in a bloody civil war triggered by the coup d'état of fascist forces under General Francisco Franco against the democratic government of President Manuel Azana. Philby worked at first as a freelance journalist, from May 1937, he served as a first-hand correspondent for the Times, reporting from the headquarters of the pro-Franco forces. He also began working for both the Soviet and British intelligence, which usually consisted of posting letters in a crude code to a fictitious girlfriend, Mil Dupont in Paris, for the Russians. He used a simpler system for MI6 delivering post at and I, France, for the British Embassy in Paris. When visiting Paris after the war, he was shocked to discover that the address that he used for Mille Dupont was that of the Soviet embassy. His controller in Paris, the Latvian Ozolin Haskins, codename Pierre, was shot in Moscow in 1937 during Stalin's purge. His successor, Boris Bazarov, suffered the same fate two years later during the purges. Both the British and the Soviets were interested in analyzing the combat performance of the new Messerschmitt Bf 109s and Panzer IN-2s deployed with fascist forces in Spain. Philby told the British, after a direct question to Franco, that German troops would never be permitted to cross Spain to attack Gibraltar. His Soviet controller at the time, Theodore Marley, 
reported in April 1937 to the NKVD, that he had personally briefed Vettelby on the need to discover the system of guarding Franco, and his entourage. Mali was one of the Soviet Union's most powerful and influential illegal controllers and recruiters. With the goal of potentially arranging Franco's assassination, Philby was instructed to report on vulnerable points in Franco's security and recommend ways to gain access to him and his staff. However, such an act was never a real possibility, upon debriefing Philby in London on 24 May 1937, Marley wrote to the NKVD, though devoted and ready to sacrifice himself, Philby, does not possess the physical courage and other qualities necessary for this, assassination, attempt. In December 1937, during the Battle of Tyrol, a Republican shell hit just in front of the car in which Philby was traveling with the correspondence Edward J. Neal of the Associated Press, Bradish Johnson of Newsweek, and Ernest Sheepshanks of Reuters. Johnson was killed outright, and Neil and Sheepshanks soon died of their injuries. Philby suffered only a minor head wound. As a result of this accident, Philby, who was well liked by the nationalist forces whose victories he trumpeted, was awarded the Red Cross of Military Merit by Franco on 2 March 1938. Philby found that the award proved helpful in obtaining access to fascist circles. Before then, he later wrote, there had been a lot of criticism of British journalists from Franco officers who seemed to think that the British in general must be a lot of communists because so many were fighting with the international brigades. After I had been wounded and decorated by Franco himself, I became known as the English decorated by Franco and all sorts of doors opened to me. 1938, Walter Kravitsky, a former GIU officer in Paris who had defected to France the previous year, traveled to the United States and published an account of his time in Stalin's secret service. He testified before the Dyes Committee regarding Soviet espionage within the United States. In 1940 he was interviewed by MI5 officers in London, led by Jane Archer. Kravitsky claimed that two Soviet intelligence agents had penetrated the British Foreign Office, and that a third Soviet intelligence agent had worked as a journalist for a British newspaper during the Civil War in Spain. No connection with Philby was made at the time, and Kravitsky was found shot in a Washington hotel room the following year. Alexander Orlov, Philby's controller in Madrid, who had once met him in Perpignan, France with the bulge of an automatic rifle clearly showing through his raincoat, also defected. To protect his family, still living in the USSR, he said nothing about Philby, an agreement Stalin respected. On a short trip back from Spain, Philby tried to recruit Flora Solomon as a Soviet agent, she was the daughter of a Russian banker and gold dealer, a relative of the Rothschilds, and wife of a London stockbroker. At the same time, Burgess was trying to get her into MI6. But the resident in France, probably Pierre at this time, suggested to Moscow that he suspected Philby's motives. Solomon introduced Philby to the woman who would become Philby's second wife, Aileen Furs. Solomon went to work for the British retailer Marks and Spencer. In July 1939, Philby returned to the Times office in London. When Britain declared war on Germany in September 1939, Philby's contact with his Soviet controllers was lost and Philby failed to attend the meetings that were necessary for his work. During the war from September 1939 until the Dunkirk evacuation, Philby worked as the Times' first-hand correspondent with the British Expeditionary Force headquarters. After being evacuated from Boulogne on 21 May, he returned to France in mid-June and began representing the Daily Telegraph in addition to the Times. He briefly reported from Cherbourg and Brest, sailing for Plymouth less than 24 hours before the French surrendered to Germany in June 1940. 1940, on the recommendation of Burgess, Philby joined MI6's Section D, a secret organization charged with investigating how enemies might be attacked through non-military means. Philby and Burgess ran a training course for would-be saboteurs at Brickendenbury Manor in Hertfordshire. His time at Section D, however, was short-lived, the tiny, 
ineffective, and slightly comic section was soon absorbed by the Special Operations Executive, SOE, in the summer of 1940. Burgess was arrested in September for drunken driving and was subsequently fired, while Philby was appointed as an instructor on clandestine propaganda at the SOE's finishing school for agents at the estate of Lord Montague in Bewley, Hampshire. Philby's role as an instructor of sabotage agents again brought him to the attention of the Soviet Joint State Political Directorate, OGPU. This role allowed him to conduct sabotage and instruct agents on how to properly conduct sabotage. The new London resident, Ivan Chaikaev, re-established contact and asked for a list of names of British agents being trained to enter the USSR. Philby replied that none had been sent, and that none were undergoing training at that time. This statement was underlined, twice in red and marked with two question marks, clearly indicating their confusion and questioning of this, by disbelieving staff at Moscow Central in the Lubyanka, according to Genrik Borovic, who saw the telegrams much later in the KGB archives. Philby provided Stalin with advance warning of Operation Barbarossa and of the Japanese intention to strike into Southeast Asia instead of attacking the USSR as Hitler had urged. The first was ignored as a provocation, but the second, when this was confirmed by the Russo-German journalist and spy in Tokyo, Richard Sorg, contributed to Stalin's decision to begin transporting troops from the Far East in time for the counteroffensive around Moscow. By September 1941, Philby began working for Section 5 of MI6, a section responsible for offensive counterintelligence. On the strength of his knowledge and experience of Franco's Spain, Philby was put in charge of the subsection which dealt with Spain and Portugal. This entailed responsibility for a network of undercover operatives in several cities such as Madrid, Lisbon, Gibraltar, and Tangier. At this time, the German Opfer was active in Spain, particularly around the British naval base of Gibraltar, which its agents hoped to watch with many cameras and radars to track Allied supply ships in the western Mediterranean. Thanks to British counterintelligence efforts, of which Philby's Iberian subsection formed a significant part, the project never came to fruition. During 1942-43, Philby's responsibilities were then expanded to include North Africa and Italy, and he was made the deputy head of Section 5 under Major Felix Cowgill, an army officer seconded to CIS. In early 1944, as it became clear that the Soviet Union was likely to once more prove a significant adversary to Britain, CIS reactivated Section 9, which dealt with anti-communist efforts. In late 1944 Philby, on instructions from his Soviet handler, maneuvered through the system successfully to replace Cowgill as head of Section 9. Charles Arnold Baker, an officer of German birth, born Wolfgang von Blumenthal, working for Richard Gatti in Belgium and later transferred to the Norwegian-slash-Swedish border, voiced many suspicions of Philby and Philby's intentions but was ignored time and time again. While working in Section 5, Philby had become acquainted with James Jesus Angleton, a young American counterintelligence officer working in liaison with CIS in London. Angleton, later chief of the CIA counterintelligence staff, became suspicious of Philby when he failed to pass on information relating to a British agent executed by the Gestapo in Germany. It later emerged that the agent, known as Schmidt, had also worked as an informant for the Rote Capelle organization, which sent information to both London and Moscow. Nevertheless, Angleton's suspicions went unheard. In late summer 1943, the CIS provided the GIU an official report on the activities of German agents in Bulgaria and Romania, soon to be invaded by the Soviet Union. The NKVD complained to Cecil Barclay, the CIS representative in Moscow, that information had been withheld. Barclay reported the complaint to London. Philby claimed to have overheard discussion of this by chance and sent a report to his controller. This turned out to be identical with Barclay's dispatch, convincing the NKVD that Philby had seen the full Barclay report. A similar lapse occurred with a report from the Imperial Japanese Embassy in Moscow sent to Tokyo. The NKVD received the same report from Richard Sorg, 
but with an extra paragraph claiming that Hitler might seek a separate peace with the Soviet Union. These lapses by Philby aroused intense suspicion in Moscow. Elena Modshinskaya at GUG headquarters in Moscow assessed all material from the Cambridge Five. She noted that they produced an extraordinary wealth of information on German war plans but next to nothing on the repeated question of British penetration of Soviet intelligence in either London or Moscow. Philby had repeated his claim that there were no such agents. She asked, could the CIS really be such fools they failed to notice suitcase loads of papers leaving the office? Could they have overlooked Philby's communist wife? Modshinskaya concluded that all were double agents, working essentially for the British. A more serious incident occurred in August 1945, when Konstantin Volkov, an NKVD agent and vice consul in Istanbul, requested political asylum in Britain for himself and his wife. For a large sum of money, Volkov offered the names of three Soviet agents inside Britain, two of whom worked in the Foreign Office, and a third who worked in counter-espionage in London. Philby was given the task of dealing with Volkov by British intelligence. He warned the Soviets of the attempted defection and travelled personally to Istanbul, ostensibly to handle the matter on behalf of CIS but, in reality, to ensure that Volkov had been neutralised. By the time he arrived in Turkey, three weeks later, Volkov had been removed to Moscow. The intervention of Philby in the affair and the subsequent capture of Volkov by the Soviets might have seriously compromised Philby's position. However, Volkov's defection had been discussed with the British Embassy in Ankara on telephones which turned out to have been tapped by Soviet intelligence. Additionally, Volkov had insisted that all written communications about him take place by bag rather than by telegraph, causing a delay in reaction that might plausibly have given the Soviets time to uncover his plans. Philby was thus able to evade blame and detection. A month later Igor Gazienka, a cipher clerk in Ottawa, took political asylum in Canada, and gave the Royal Canadian Mounted Police names of agents operating within the British Empire that were known to him. When Jane Archer, who had interviewed Kravitsky, was appointed to Philby's section he moved her off investigatory work in case she became aware of his past. He later wrote she had got a tantalizing scrap of information about a young English journalist whom the Soviet intelligence had sent to Spain during the Civil War. And here she was plunked down in my midst. In February 1947, Philby was appointed head of British intelligence for Turkey, and posted to Istanbul with his second wife, Aileen, and their family. His public position was that of first secretary at the British consulate, in reality, his intelligence work required overseeing British agents and working with the Turkish security services. Philby planned to infiltrate five or six groups of émigrés into Soviet Armenia or Soviet Georgia. But efforts among the expatriate community in Paris produced just two recruits. Turkish intelligence took them to a border crossing into Georgia but soon afterwards shots were heard. Another effort was made using a Turkish galette for a seaborne landing, but it never left port. He was implicated in a similar campaign in Albania. Colonel David Smiley, an aristocratic guards officer who had helped Enver Hoxha and his communist guerrillas to liberate Albania, now prepared to remove Hoxha. He trained Albanian commandos, some of whom were former Nazi collaborators, in Libya or Malta. From 1947, they infiltrated the southern mountains to build support for former King Zog. The first three missions, overland from Greece, were trouble-free. Larger numbers were landed by sea and air under Operation Valuable, which continued until 1951, increasingly under the influence of the newly formed CIA. Stuart Menzies, head of CIS, disliked the idea, which was promoted by former so men now in CIS. Most infiltrators were caught by the SIGIMI, the Albanian security service. Clearly there had been leaks and Philby was later suspected as one of the leakers. 
His own comment was I do not say that people were happy under the regime but the CIA underestimated the degree of control that the authorities had over the country. Philby later wrote of his attitude towards the operation in Albania. The agents we sent into Albania were armed men intent on murder, sabotage and assassination, they knew the risks they were running. I was serving the interests of the Soviet Union, and those interests required that these men were defeated. To the extent that I helped defeat them, even if it caused their deaths, I have no regrets. Aileen Philby had suffered since childhood from psychological problems which caused her to inflict injuries upon herself. In 1948, troubled by the heavy drinking and frequent depressions that had become a feature of her husband's life in Istanbul, she experienced a breakdown of this nature, staging an accident and injecting herself with urine, and insulin to cause skin disfigurations. She was sent to a clinic in Switzerland to recover. Upon her return to Istanbul in late 1948, she was badly burned in an incident with a charcoal stove and returned to Switzerland. Shortly afterward, Philby was moved to the job as Chief CIS representative in Washington, D.C., with his family. In September 1949, the Philbys arrived in the United States. Officially, his post was that of First Secretary to the British Embassy, in reality, he served as Chief British Intelligence Representative in Washington. His office oversaw a large amount of urgent and top-secret communications between the United States and London. Philby was also responsible for liaising with the CIA and promoting more aggressive Anglo-American intelligence operations. A leading figure within the CIA was Philby's wary former colleague, James Jesus Angleton, with whom he once again found himself working closely. Angleton remained suspicious of Philby, but lunched with him every week in Washington. However, a more serious threat to Philby's position had come to light. During the summer of 1945, a Soviet cipher clerk had reused a one-time pad to transmit intelligence traffic. This mistake made it possible to break the normally impregnable code. Contained in the traffic, intercepted and decrypted as part of the Venona project, was information that documents had been sent to Moscow from the British Embassy in Washington. The intercepted messages revealed that the British Embassy source, identified as Homer, traveled to New York City to meet his Soviet contact, twice a week. Philby had been briefed on the situation shortly before reaching Washington in 1949, it was clear to Philby that the agent was Donald McLean, who worked in the British Embassy at the time and whose wife, Melinda, lived in New York. Philby had to help discover the identity of Homer, but also wished to protect McLean. In January 1950, on evidence provided by the Venona intercepts, Soviet atomic spy Klaus Fuchs was arrested. His arrest led to others, Harry Gold, a courier with whom Fuchs had worked, David Greenglass, and Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. The investigation into the British Embassy leak was still ongoing, and the stress of it was exacerbated by the arrival in Washington, in October 1950, of Guy Burgess, Philby's unstable and dangerously alcoholic fellow Soviet spy. Burgess, who had been given a post as second secretary at the British Embassy, took up residence in the Philby family home and rapidly set about causing offence to all and sundry. Aileen Philby resented him and disliked his presence, Americans were offended by his natural superciliousness and utter contempt for the whole pyramid of values, attitudes, and courtesies of the American way of life. J. Edgar Hoover complained that Burgess used British Embassy automobiles to avoid arrest when he cruised Washington in pursuit of homosexual encounters. His dissolution had a troubling effect on Philby, the morning after a particularly disastrous and drunken party, a guest returning to collect his car heard voices upstairs and found Kim and Guy in the bedroom drinking champagne. They had already been down to the embassy but being unable to work had come back. Burgess's presence was problematic for Philby, yet it was potentially dangerous for Philby to leave him unsupervised. The situation in Washington was tense. From April 1950, McLean had been the prime suspect in the investigation into the embassy leak. 
Philby had undertaken to devise an escape plan which would warn McLean, currently in England, of the intense suspicion he was under and arrange for him to flee. Burgess had to get to London to warn McLean, who was under surveillance. In early May 1951, Burgess got three speeding tickets in a single day, then pleaded diplomatic immunity, causing an official complaint to be made to the British ambassador. Burgess was sent back to England, where he met Maclean in his London club. The CIS planned to interrogate Maclean on 28 May 1951. On 23 May, concerned that Maclean had not yet fled, Philby Wyatt Burgess, ostensibly about his Lincoln convertible abandoned in the embassy car park. If he did not act at once it would be too late, the telegram read, because, Philby, would send his car to the scrap heap. There was nothing more, he, could do. On the 25th of May, Burgess drove McLean from his home at Tatsfield, Surrey to Southampton, where both boarded the steamship fillets to France and then proceeded to Moscow. Burgess had intended to aid McLean in his escape, not accompany him in it. The affair of the missing diplomats, as it was referred to before Burgess and McLean surfaced in Moscow, attracted a great deal of public attention, and Burgess's disappearance, which identified him as complicit in McLean's espionage, deeply compromised Philby's position. Under a cloud of suspicion raised by his highly visible and intimate association with Burgess, Philby returned to London. There, he underwent MI5 interrogation aimed at ascertaining whether he had acted as a third man in Burgess and McLean's spy ring. In July 1951, he resigned from MI6, preempting his all but inevitable dismissal. Even after Philby's departure from MI6, speculation regarding his possible Soviet affiliations continued. Interrogated repeatedly regarding his intelligence work and his connection with Burgess, he continued to deny that he had acted as a Soviet agent. From 1952, Philby struggled to find work as a journalist, eventually, in August 1954, accepting a position with a diplomatic newsletter called the Fleet Street Letter. Lacking access to material of value and out of touch with Soviet intelligence, he all but ceased to operate as a Soviet agent. On 7 November 1955, Philby was officially cleared by Foreign Secretary Harold Macmillan, who told the House of Commons, I have no reason to conclude that Mr. Philby has at any time betrayed the interests of his country, or to identify him with the so-called third man, if indeed there was one. Following this, Philby gave a press conference in which, calmly, confidently, and without the stammer, he had struggled with since childhood, he reiterated his innocence, declaring, I have never been a communist. After being exonerated, Philby was no longer employed by MI6 and Soviet intelligence lost all contact with him. In August 1956 he was sent to Beirut as a Middle East correspondent for The Observer and The Economist. There, his journalism served as cover for renewed work for MI6. In Lebanon, Philby at first lived in Mahala Jamil, his father's large household located in the village of Ayaltoun, just outside Beirut. Following the departure of his father and stepbrothers for Saudi Arabia, Philby continued to live alone in Isle Toon, but took a flat in Beirut after beginning an affair with Eleanor, the Seattle-born wife of New York Times correspondent Sam Pope, Brewer. Following Aileen Philby's death in 1957 and Eleanor's subsequent divorce from Brewer, Philby and Eleanor were married in London in 1959 and set up house together in Beirut. From 1960, Philby's formerly marginal work as a journalist became more substantial and he frequently traveled throughout the Middle East, including Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, Kuwait, and Yemen. 1961, Anatoly Galitsyn, a major in the first chief directorate of the KGB, defected to the United States from his diplomatic post in Helsinki. Galitsyn offered the CIA revelations of Soviet agents within American and British intelligence services. Following his debriefing in the U.S., Galitsyn was sent to CIS for further questioning. The head of the MI6, Dick White, only recently transferred from MI5, had suspected Philby as the third man. 
Galitzin proceeded to confirm White's suspicions about Philby's role. Nicholas Elliott, an MI6 officer recently stationed in Beirut who was a friend of Philby's and had previously believed in his innocence, was tasked with attempting to secure Philby's full confession. It is unclear whether Philby had been alerted, but Eleanor noted that as 1962 wore on, expressions of tension in his life became worse and were reflected in bouts of deep depression and drinking. She recalled returning home to Beirut from a sightseeing trip in Jordan to find Philby hopelessly drunk and incoherent with grief on the terrace of the flat, mourning the death of a little pet fox which had fallen from the balcony. When Nicholas Elliott met Philby in late 1962, the first time since Galitzin's defection, he found Philby too drunk to stand and with a bandaged head, he had fallen repeatedly and cracked his skull on a bathroom radiator, requiring stitches. Philby told Elliot that he was half expecting to see him. Elliot confronted him, saying, I once looked up to you, Kim. My God, how I despise you now. I hope you've enough decency left to understand why. Prompted by Elliot's accusations, Philby confirmed the charges of espionage and described his intelligence activities on behalf of the Soviets. However, when Elliot asked him to sign a written statement, he hesitated and requested a delay in the interrogation. Another meeting was scheduled to take place in the last week of January. It has since been suggested that the whole confrontation with Elliot had been a charade to convince the KGB that Philby had to be brought back to Moscow where he could serve as a British penetration agent of Moscow Center. On the evening of 23 January 1963, Philby vanished from Beirut, failing to meet his wife for a dinner party at the home of Glencairn Balfour Paul, first secretary at the British Embassy. The Dolmatova, a Soviet freighter bound for Odessa, had left Beirut that morning so abruptly that cargo was left scattered over the docks, Philby claimed that he left Beirut on board this ship. However, others maintain that he escaped through Syria, overland to Soviet Armenia and thence to Russia. It was not until 1 July 1963 that Philby's flight to Moscow was officially confirmed. The 30th of July Soviet officials announced that they had granted him political asylum in the USSR, along with Soviet citizenship. When the news broke, MI6 came under criticism for failing to anticipate and block Philby's defection, though Elliot was to claim he could not have prevented Philby's flight. Journalist Ben McIntyre, author of several works on espionage, wrote in his 2014 book on Philby that MI6 might have left open the opportunity for Philby to flee to Moscow to avoid an embarrassing public trial. Philby himself thought this might have been the case, according to McIntyre. Upon his arrival in Moscow in January 1963, Philby discovered that he was not a colonel in the KGB, as he had been led to believe. He was paid 500 rubles a month and his family was not immediately able to join him in exile. Philby was under virtual house arrest, guarded, with all visitors screened by the KGB. It was ten years before he was given a minor role in the training of KGB recruits. Mikhail Lyubimov, his closest KGB contact, explained that this was to guard his safety, but later admitted that the real reason was the KGB's fear that Philby would return to London. Secret files released to the National Archives in late 2020 indicated that the government had intentionally conducted a campaign to keep Kim Philby's spying confidential to minimize political embarrassment and prevented the publication of his memoirs, according to a report by The Guardian. Nonetheless, the information was publicized in 1967 when Philby granted an interview to Murray Sale of the Times in Moscow. Philby confirmed that he had worked for the KGB, and that his purpose in life was to destroy imperialism. Philby occupied himself by writing his memoirs, which were finally published in the UK in 1968 under the title My Silent War, it was not published in the Soviet Union until 1980. In the book, Philby says that his loyalties were always with the communists, he considered himself not to have been a double agent but a straight penetration agent working in the Soviet interest. Philby continued to read the Times, which was not generally available in the USSR, listened to the BBC World Service, and was an avid follower of cricket. 
Philby's award of the Order of the British Empire was cancelled and annulled in 1965. Though Philby claimed publicly in January 1988 that he did not regret his decisions and that he missed nothing about England except some friends, Coleman's mustard, and Lee in Perrin's Worcestershire sauce, his wife Rufina Ivanovna Pukova later described Philby as disappointed in many ways by what he found in Moscow. He saw people suffering too much, but he consoled himself by arguing that the ideals were right but the way they were carried out was wrong. The fault lay with the people in charge. Pukova said, he was struck by disappointment, brought to tears. He said, why do old people live so badly here? After all, they won the war. Philby drank heavily and suffered from loneliness and depression, according to Rufina, he had attempted suicide by slashing his wrists sometime in the 1960s. Philby found work in the early 1970s in the KGB's active measures department churning out fabricated documents. Working from genuine unclassified and public CIA or U.S. Department of State documents, Philby inserted sinister paragraphs regarding U.S. plans. The KGB would stamp the documents top secret and begin their circulation. For the Soviets, Philby was an invaluable asset, ensuring the correct use of idiomatic and diplomatic English phrases in their disinformation efforts. Philby died of heart failure in Moscow in 1988. He was given a hero's funeral, and posthumously awarded numerous medals by the Soviets, Order of Lenin, Order of the Red Banner, Order of Friendship of Peoples, Order of the Great Patriotic War, Lenin Medal, Jubilee Medal 40 Years of Victory in the Great Patriotic War 1941-1945. In a 1981 lecture to the East German Security Service, Stasi, Philby attributed the failure of the British Secret Service to unmask him as due in great part to the British class system, it was inconceivable that one born into the ruling class of the British Empire would be a traitor, to the amateurish and incompetent nature of the organization, and to so many in MI6 having so much to lose if he was proven to be a spy. He had the policy of never confessing, a document in his own handwriting was dismissed as a forgery. He said that at the time of his recruitment as a spy there were no prospects of his being useful, he was instructed to make his way into the secret service, which took years, starting with journalism and building up contacts in the establishment. He said that there was no discipline there, he made friends with the archivist, which enabled him for years to take secret documents home, many unrelated to his own work, and bring them back the next day, his handler took and photographed them overnight. When he was instructed to remove and replace his boss, Felix Cowgill, he asked if it was proposed to shoot him or something, but was told to use bureaucratic intrigue. He said it was a very dirty story, but after all our work does imply getting dirty hands from time to time but we do it for a cause that is not dirty in any way. Commenting on his betrayal of the operation to secretly send thousands of Albanians back into their country to overthrow the communist regime, which led to many being killed, Philby tries to turn it to his credit, even saying that he helped prevent another world war. Thank you all so much for listening. I really hope that you enjoyed today's strange tale. If you did please smash that gorgeous like button, and subscribe so that you will be notified to future shows. Also if you could write a 5 star review that would really help us get the word out, so other people can enjoy the podcast as well. You can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube at Strange Tales Pod. Or you can message me at strangetalespod at gmail.com, with feedback or ideas on future shows. If you would like to support the podcast you can do so through Patreon, go to patreon.com forward slash strangetalespod. Where we have plans from as little as 3 US dollars a month and you can opt out any time. Any help is much appreciated. This is me your host Winston R. Douglas signing out for now. Thanks again hope to see you again soon.